What's going on everybody? I'm Andrew Carter here alongside Jennifer Bolden and this is the Steel Trap Mine Show. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the whole, um, I, I guess, umbrella of the banking crisis with, yep, we'll focus both on Silicon Valley Bank, um, but look at the related events and you know, try to cap everything for you guys. We're just going to have our discussion. We know that this bit has uh, been covered a lot, but we have our own viewpoints on it. And we'd just like to share it. And then we have Archie here, too, who has a really important position on everything that's going Yeah, I think people watch it for him. They don't want <laughs> No one wants my take on stocks or any of that. <laughs> they watch for the dog. I think if, that, if he's in the thumbnail, that's, prob that, that's like going to get the most clicks. So there's, there's click, like people do click bait, like, you know, a, a misleading negative title, but I, I get the only clickbait I would stoop to is a dog in the thumbnail. Oh, like poodle enthusiasts. People, like, we don't think it's a dog video. They get sucked into hearing about like, well, banks and economics. So yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna talk about this, and it's it's really scary. I think it it's it scared me because when this happened, we were on a trip to Florida, and I was thousands of miles away from my daughters. And it scared me enough to just want to come home. Well, it scared me because I haven't been to Florida in three years. And like, literally exactly three years ago. And what happened exactly three years ago? Everything hit the fan. At one, I was down there. It was March. I have my calendar. It was March 12th. Um, so I, 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 mean, I had to get the hell out of Dodge. It felt... When the pandemic hit, it felt like, you know, if you see those clips um, of people like during the Vietnam War or Afghan the Afghanistan War where they're trying to flee, you know, those like harrowing mm -hmm. scenes where they're on like the airplane and they're like hanging on to it for dear life. Well, that's, that was how I felt Florida three years ago. So we had an awesome trip down there and you know, we were both really excited, but I had this weird deja vu because the second day... Um, the headline breaks of the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history, and it's like, oh, every time I'm down and here, you think that that is from the past, like that's that can't happen now. And but the truth is, is we are doing things now that make it even more probable for it to happen. Well, I mean, this country has a banking crisis every twenty years. I don't think a lot of folks realize that. Now, I mean, they might look at the depression and that's you know the most significant uh example but um in the early 80s um i think it was the fifth or sixth biggest bank called continental illinois mm -hmm. um you know they had a run and they were taking over the fdic and then in the late 80s um you know the savings and loan crisis all these I, is things is that grant union the savings and loan uh -huh. what's the difference between savings and loan in a bank you do not know I'll have to look that up, but no, I don't know. I think, what's that movie, Wonderful Life? He works at a savings and loan institution. The Christmas movie? I don't know, but so I think that we need to, to in order to frame this for people, and I think that mm -hmm. people don't really understand this, we need to talk about fractional reserve banking and how much of your deposit is taken and invested and how much funds are actually left for depositors to withdraw. Right, I mean, so we can kind of start at the square one of it. Uh, right, because this is like, you know, we do this show because I don't know a whole lot and I'm learning as we go and we've researched these topics and it's an opportunity to really, um, it, to start kind of a, you know, finding its one-on-one. So mm -hmm. for, the, for the people like me and for the poodles out there, what is fractional reserve banking? So fractional reserve banking, um, when I first learned about it, in high school, it's a it's a hard like concept to wrap your head around, even as an adult. Like when when you kind of understand the banking system works, you're like, wow, that's that's how money's created. That's what the whole you know the 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 foundation of the whole system. When you put money um, into a checking account, so let's say you have ten thousand um, dollars in a Chase checking account, um, and you think, oh, my money is all you know, there in the bank, um, I'm, I can withdraw any time. Um, the bank only keeps a very small percentage of your funds on deposit. And 
I, I used to at one point be, you know, 10, 20%. I think now it's even lower. I, the, the current reserve requirement, it might be like 1%. It's, it's really It's low. something paltry. It, at one point it was zero. They didn't have to have any. So what, what it is... Um, yeah, I thought, I heard it was like 1% to 3%. Is that right? The last time I checked, it was one. But the pandemic, oh the pandemic it was zero. So they had to keep no money on reserve. But so he, here's how it works. And this, this is how money is created, basically. You have $10,000 in your Chase Checky account. The bank, they take that money and they loan it to their customers. So think uh, mortgages, car loans. Now, you know, if they only have a 1% reserve requirement, or let's say hypothetically 10%, it's like, oh, let's take Jennifer's $9,000, we'll lend it to someone uh, who needs a car loan, and let's say... But if it's if it's 1%, it's like $9,900. Right, but it's, let's say, hypothetically, it's 10. Which is being like super generous. Should, well, it was that at one point, and may, maybe we'll get back to that, but um, I don't want to get in the weeds too much about reserve requirement, because they really don't change it a whole lot. You don't, you really don't hear about it. I think you'll hear about it by design because if you knew like, oh, none of this money is in the bank. I mean, if it was 20%. Very, yeah, very little amount of money is, 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 it's gone. It's not in the bank anymore for you to pull out. So if you go in and you put in $2 million and then the next day you want to go in and pull that $2 million out, they don't, you know, a big bank can do it, but if everybody came did yeah, at the same bank, time, that, yeah. that's what caused the bank failure. But, um, anyways, hypothetically, 10,000 and, um, you know, there's 10% reserve requirement. It's like, oh, let's take that 9,000 and let's lend it out, uh, for say 12,000. And then that, you know, that $12,000 of credit, that's new money created. So I took your deposit for 9,000 and I, I've just created $12,000 of new, or I guess it's 3,000. I don't want to can I get too far on this, but just created $3,000 of new money. So that, that is how most money is created. So commercial banks, they're lending out your deposits by you know, keeping none of it in reserve. Um, you know, by lending it out, and there's benefits to it because again, this is how you know folks like you and me. I mean, it's how the everyday person is getting student loans, car loans, um, you know, or if you're just running up a huge credit card for a golf tournament, whatever you're doing with it. But um, I mean, so we talk about money printing, money being created. You know, it happens at the the government, the, you know, the Federal Reserve level. A lot of money is created by your local bank. So who, who is printing money? Where's all the money coming from? You know, it could be a small, you know, bank um, down on Main Street or, you know, if you bank with uh, a big bank, you know, that's, it could come from that. But that is... Well, it also, it also saves us from fees because the, you know, the percentages that they're making off of those investments, they're using that to offset um, a fees because basically they're, they're, they're supposed to be holding our money for us. And I don't think a lot of people realize this. Um, if there is one thing I want to drive home for the audience, like really, I mean, really take this in. Um, I mean, your your checky account, like the money you have there, that is a liability for the bank. I mean, that literally, that is not. You have money in a bank. That's not an asset. That's that's your money owed to you. It's a liability. Um, but again, they're they're taking your deposits, they're lending it out, um, and you know essentially what they're paying zero percent interest. They, they still might be. They're paying this very low interest rate, and then when they lend that money out, that that difference is how they make money. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So, yeah, that, so they're making money that way instead of charging us fees, mm -hmm. and they can be competitive in the market. Now, when it comes to SVB, they had long-term U.S. Treasuries. As they their asset. Yeah, they had a they had a large percentage, and it's risky because they had a long. It actually, is not risk. I mean, it was risky with the current environment, but it might not yeah. be at the time. Right. So the with the interest rates going up so high, the value of these long term treasuries went down. 
-hmm. And then when they went to to sell them to, to liquidate them because they had depositors pulling money out, they were taking a loss. Right. I mean, so those the bonds they have is an asset on their book. Uh, you know, again, that it is an asset they have with all the bonds they own. And say the bond is valued at you know a billion dollars, but it's like anything else. It, it its market value is a billion. That doesn't mean when I go to sell it, it's going to be worth that much. Um, you know, it's a fluctuating value. If that asset's held to maturity, it is, you know, at the billion dollars. But when they went to sell it, they had to take a huge, at that point becomes a, a realized loss. It's not unrealized. Well, what's interesting about this is the Federal Reserve was saying, we're going to raise interest rates until we break something. And, and it, it's broken. they broke. They broke SVB. Right. Well, this, this happens free. This has happened historically. You can look at precedent. In 2006, they started raising rates. What did they break? I don't know. The housing market. In the 80s, we started raising rates. We, um, and I, I'm not going to get into the details of this you know, too much, but a uh, high level overview. In the early 80s, we started raising interest rates. It caused um, a banking crisis actually in Latin America. They had a lost decade. Oh, I so we, know that. I, when, when the Fed raised interest rates, it, just know that. Um, really, that's another point taken. They raise interest rates, we break something. Mm -hmm. And it could, and it's not just America, this is a global economy. We mm -hmm. raise rates, it could break things in China or Europe. Um, in the 80s, it happened to be Latin America. And, and they know that going in, which, Probably why they were several months behind the curve. They should have been doing this like way. They should have been doing this way earlier. So I've read. I was. I've watched a lot of other YouTube videos of experts and and read. And they said that there was a couple things also working against this bank. And one of that was the technology of the depositors being able to quickly pull funds out. And that's why the bank, you know, it it fell so quickly. Right. Um, so, I, shifting gears a little bit, we're you know we're talking about the fractional reserve banking, mm -hmm. and the bank's only keeping you know a very little percentage. Mm -hmm. So, if they're keeping one or two percent, now you or me could go to a bank, and I you know I could withdraw most of my money, but if ever, if everyone goes at the same time, so I mean I think a, a bank run is kind of self-explanatory. We, we don't have to explain it. When everyone, well, I think so. I think you should explain it. Well, yeah, a bank run, that is just when everyone at the same time goes to withdraw their money. And um, when everyone's withdrawing their money, the bank doesn't have enough to meet their deposits. Because if they're, if they're only keeping 1% or 2% as your deposit and they have thousands of customers, then yes, if, if everyone withdraws at the same time, they can't meet that obligation. Now, to do that, they have to, A, borrow it from another bank, they borrow it from the Federal Reserve, or they sell assets. Now, borrowing from the Fed, that's problematic because for a lot of banks, when they're borrowing directly from the Federal Reserve, um, it kind of signals weakness to competitors and to the marketplace. So, um, I, don't, I mean, folks watch at home, I don't know how much money you know, you would have in the bank or if you ever tried to go and withdraw several thousand at once, but like go go to a bank, try to withdraw $10,000, they'll probably tell you they need time. Um, I think well, that- they, did, they didn't have that, so they didn't, they could, so they had, um, they, they had like, what, like the majority of the depositors were the same type of depositors. Which it's all really it's all tech and crypto. They yeah, had, they're not diversified. Yeah, so they had like these depositors that had a lot of money that were, you know, in 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 the tech industry and and startups, and so they were pulling out in minutes just huge amounts of money, and that's one of the things that just really crippled them from from responding. Right. I mean, because in the old days, like in the nineteen thirties. When a when a bank run would happen, and so I, I think we've covered what a bank run is. It's when everyone goes and withdraws their deposits at once, and the bank has you know trouble meeting that demand, and we talk about why they have trouble meeting that demand. Well, we have 
a fractional reserve banking system where they're lending out our deposits, mm -hmm. they're keeping a very, very small portion of that money um, in reserve. Now, what is important, you know, for folks to know, uh, and you know, this is really going to be one of the changing dynamics, um, you know, going forward. Folks in the 1930s, if you wanted to go and take money from a bank, you had to physically go to the bank. Had to talk to a teller, set up a meeting, um, you know, what have a cashier's check ready. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd have to go and, you know, set up an account at another bank. Uh, you're having to wait in line. It's not like every all it's digital now. Yeah. You can do everything from the convenience, you can be in your car, on your phone. So it used to take, you know, hours or I mean, even days. This The Silicon Valley Bank, I mean, I, it was like a 24 hour turnaround mm -hmm. time. Yeah, uh, exactly. We've never seen that in history where a bank shuts down that quick. Um, so that's going to be a big question moving forward is, you know, this system we have, that, that's kind of the systemic risk. The, the fractional reserve banking system and the risk of bank runs, the system that's been set up for you know, over a hundred years, you know, was this system designed for you know, modern technology and well, the speed of uh, you know, um, modern technology? And, and you know, I watched a video with Caitlin Long and, and she was saying that now we have to change because we're not staying in pace with technology and now they're going to have to have more um, of more money on hand for deposit depositors, and um, it, it, they're just going to have to change it and just charge us fees. And there's going to be banks that she thinks are going to pop up, and she was actually trying to get her own bank. Um, it's very hard. Yeah, she at her application all, was actually turned down. I don't want to say it's impossible, but I mean you have to get a bank charter yeah. from the Office of the Comptroller of Currency. Yeah, but she's she's going to have a hundred percent depositor money that she's they're going to keep and they're going to charge fees and they're going to have a different mm -hmm. you know paradigm of of um, of business to, to like be able to to guarantee that money to people. Well, I think what's interesting that is not something that you know in, in a competitive marketplace and you know one bank might say oh we keep ten percent on deposit, another says we keep twenty. I, it's really it's not something banks want you to know I don't I don't think but it's, it's not something they want to talk about you know to, I mean to tell you oh we only have one percent of your money um, I mean that's I, I, and I, I hate that crap blow like banks don't want you to know this no one like you know this this secret that no one I, I mean it's not really a secret I just I don't think well, like, nobody they knows. don't want you to know nobody you go to school no one teaches you anything about this. And it does feel like it's kind of like behind closed doors and you're not allowed to know it. And like the average person, they're just like trying to make ends meet and mm -hmm. feed their families and they don't understand, they don't understand all this. And, and here's, th this is what I found very fascinating. So one of, um, one of my favorite people to read and you know, you've got to really come around to her, Lynn Alden. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and a lot of the information she's pulling, it's directly from the, uh, the St. Louis Fed. Federal Reserve mm -hmm. that's crunching these numbers. So, go so going off what what Lynn talked about, but uh, also I've uh, spoke with some people like uh, in the banking industry who are branch managers. I think the average bank you go to, they only have eighty thousand cash there. Maybe it's like a very small amount. And if you take all the banks uh, in the U.S. and just look at their their cash they have on hand, physical cash. That's in a vault. It's a hundred billion dollars total. Now, um, as far as like you know, their all the cash they have that's not physical, uh, they have three trillion uh, at the Federal Reserve, which is all on a digital ledger, basically. So you you, you put that in perspective. There's a hundred billion that all the banks have in physical cash, and then there's three trillion that they have um, on the digital ledger at the Fed. And then I think that, that it's so in, in total, it's like 20%, yeah, probably less than 20% of deposits. Well, I think that when something like this happens and there's a spotlight that is put on the uh, situation, um, now people are becoming more informed. And, and now if, if there's a light on it, 
people can make that decision. You know, if you're if you have a company and the because of the way the system's set up, the amount of work like these large corporations may have ten thousand accounts that people that they've got a whole department of people managing because only two hundred fifty thousand dollars is is uh you know guaranteed mm -hmm. you know and protected so they may have a whole department of people managing ten thousand accounts in these huge corporations or more so um it's definitely something that seems like we could change and that there's a customer there's a customer that's willing to pay fees you know i, I think moving forward that's going to be a like a bigger topic I going back the last however long 20 years uh, when the average person is going to open a checking account um, you know it could be some Joe Schmo who's uh, in high school working their first job mm -hmm. or it could be you know small business um, I mean they're looking at you know fees interest rate I, I don't think anyone's ever asked I mean that that I, I feel like no that, that's never coming up is hey what what percent does this bank keep on reserve oh. that's that that is never uh i i, I would bet money that you know that never comes up i would a bank never account. get guessed so i'm new to all this finance stuff mm -hmm. i would have never guessed it was like one or three percent but i feel like moving forward that's going to be a bigger topic of conversation is hey how much this money are you keeping on deposit mm -hmm. can you meet this now I mean, that, that sounds totally ridiculous and if the FD, you know, if they raise the FDIC insurance limit, which they probably should because of inflation, mm -hmm. should we talk about that also? Talk about whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, so the bank runs in the 1930s when it got really bad. Um, so you know, folks want to know why the Great Depression was so bad. Um, and Ben Bernanke, he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve um, several years ago, and he was, uh, I think, the dean of economics at Princeton. But not that he, he was high up in their economics department. He was one of the premier experts on the Great Depression, and he wrote a paper on why it was so bad. You know, twenty percent unemployment, food lines. Um, you know, I heard my grandpa talking about it. I mean, really, the, yeah, the desperate the desperation to talk about, and I, it's unreal. And, and why was it so bad? How could it last it so long? He had one of the most brilliant. Uh, insights um, about you know how it got so bad and it lingered the way it did. So the Great Depression uh, again, it started with I, mean, I don't want to start with everybody, not the same situation, but it started with bank runs and you know folks withdrawing their money from the bank. Now uh, in the Great Depression, one one in three banks failed in the U.S. in the Great Depression. Wow. One in, so what happens when one in three banks failed? One in three people lost their deposit. So imagine, imagine 1930. One in three people you know lose all their money in a checking account. That's what happened. That's why it, it was so. It would be like automatic. It would be automatic poverty. It for most people it was. I mean, they're they're what they're moving halfway across the country with everything they have, hoping they can find work in California. Um, I mean, yeah, people staying in food lines. So my, my grandmother was hospitalized for like malnutrition mm -hmm. because they just didn't have any food. No, my grandpa, he would work 15 hour days, um, on a fruit truck. And I, I mean, at this time, he's not even really pulling the salary. He's just happy to get free food. Like literally he's working back breaking work four hours a day. I don't, I mean, back then, maybe it was a dollar or two a day. It, it was something paltry, but he was just happy to get food. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that, that happened in the thirties and you know, the government looked at it. Um, was it Franklin Roosevelt, the president, all these people are looking at the situation saying, well, you know, this is a mess. Something has to be done. So they passed a number of laws, um, in the thirties, they have the SEC act. There's several other acts they passed that um, are basically the, the foundational. Um, it's the foundational legislation to regulate the banking industry. One of the acts they, one of the uh, issues they create, uh, a lot of people become more familiar with, 
the FDIC, also known as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which, you know, it, it is what it sounds like. It's a federal government agency whose job is to um, insure your deposit. So if a, if a bank does fail, the, you know, this agency can come in and say, well, you know, the, the bank failed, but we can pay your money up to a certain limit. Um, and, you know, that figure is getting thrown around a lot. That number is $250,000. Which, to, in today's standards, just really doesn't seem like a whole lot. No, and that limit was set in 2009 after the financial crisis, and they, they have not raised it since. Um, but would it just make sense to keep more of the money in the bank? For who? This is just a little, like, new person to finance question, but... Would it just make more sense to make laws that require banks to keep more of the depositors' money in the bank? Well, I mean, these are just the stupid questions I have. I, I see. On, on theory, that would sound that would sound good, but that, then the bank can't lend out as much money. So yeah, it might mean less. Charge fees. Well, well, it might. It could mean less mortgages for people. Um, I don't let, it could be less. It's possible. I don't know. I feel like most mortgages are not banks. They're like, you know, mortgage companies, consumer finance. I, I have to look up those numbers. And don't they issue like CDs and that kind of thing? Banks. banks. Mm -hmm. So that could be. Okay, so the U.S. government is, is bailing out this bank and the other banks that have fallen. So there was a, two more? Um, so there was Silvergate. They, they just they, they shut down voluntarily. Mm -hmm. um, they were really heavy in crypto. Uh, they, they were doing something where they're going to get in a lot of trouble. Um, I, I, I heard about it. Um, uh, they were discussing on Josh Brown's podcast. Um, but I, I think what they were doing was not like legal. And there, there was lawsuits of people saying and writing that whatever, it was money laundering, some kind of criminal element, but this, this whole thing started with Silvergate three weeks ago. This was a small bank in California that went all in on crypto. They, and they were the most crypto-involved bank, um, and they got hit really hard. But I think something happened. They were, they were not above board with it, and they knew they were going to get in trouble. I, I don't think this ever happened. I've never heard of it. I, I, I looked through recent history, I've never, like, a, a bank to come out and just voluntarily shut down is what they, they, they literally gave themselves up to, it, it's like going, it's like surrendering, they went to the FDIC, surrender, and said, take us over, so now, it started with them, really. Now, what, what bank was it that was still solvent, and they took it over anyway? Signature. Signature, and isn't Signature going to file a lawsuit, because due I, process wasn't followed? I don't, I, I'm not sure, but it, so it started with uh, with Signature Bank, and then you know there's Silicon Valley Bank, and I think that's I think Signature they they were teetering, and they got taken over. But they were still solvent, so I, I'm hearing that law a lawsuit may be imminent because due process wasn't followed properly. Uh, I would have to look it up. Um, now they're interesting because they sat on the board for Signature Bank. Who? Barney Frank. If you're familiar, no one's heard of him. Barney Fred, he's a very renowned, famous, you know, politician, congressperson from Massachusetts. He wrote the Dodd-Frank Act. I mean, it's literally his namesake. Uh, that was passed out of the Great Financial Crisis, and that that law is a set. That that's the law that you know regulates the banks. That was the most significant banking legislation. So, yeah, this it, this bank is teetering. One of their board directors is the guy who wrote the legislation, and I, I don't want to cast aspersions, but he, he made that a part of rolling back his own legislation. That's another thing I want to talk That's about. That's really, really interesting. And it's interesting that the Federal Reserve has put these banks in a position that is so difficult. You know, and it shows you that things were already kind of, you know, it's not that robust. So, um, so who is the, when you're looking at banks? So, what the average person when you're looking at banks, what banks are at higher risk for something like this happening to? Small community banks. 
Small banks. Um, a big bank, uh, whereas JP Morgan, PNC, you know, they're a lot more insulated. Um, they have whatever lobbyists, lawyers they hire. Um, the other thing I would say, um, and this is kind of an unfortunate way the system is set up, the big banks, they have direct access to the Federal Reserve. So within the Federal Reserve system, there's what's called primary dealers. That's banks who can buy newly created money directly from the Federal Reserve. It's a very how small number. How do you number. buy money? Um, so how money is created? Um, I've talked about can this I in buy previous. Some money? <laughs> yeah, imagine that life. Though. There, there literally are there are people who they can buy new money from the Federal Reserve. There, there are people who can do that. But, but then you can only lend, there's only certain things you can do with it. It's not like you can buy money and do whatever you, 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 you buy the it's money. It's borrowing, from, isn't it? It's yeah, you, borrowing. yeah, you buy money from the Fed and they say you can lend it to other people. It's not like, it's like people going and buying money from the Fed and then they can do whatever they want with it. Yeah, there's, I, I mean, I'm sure there's loopholes and stuff they find. Um, you know, we've talked about this on previous episodes, the way money is created. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to talk about it too much because I, I, you know, I'm going to do a separate video where I explain only that and do it in like precise detail. But yeah, so ba basically uh, there's, there's primary dealers. There's only 24 banks that do this. You know, there are Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, uh, PNC is probably on there. It's a very small number. Chase. Yeah, well, I think JP Morgan is Chase. Are they separate? I, have to look that up. I think they're the same the company. JP Morgan Chase. Yeah, they're the so, same. And anyway, they what they, they have you know uh, bonds, treasury bonds on their uh, books, and they sell those bonds to the Fed in exchange for newly created money. That's how money is created, basically. Okay. Now, why is that significant? Only the big banks have access to the Fed. And can you know borrow directly from the Fed, buy newly created money from the Fed. The local small bank, uh, they do not have the same kind of access. And also the small bank, they probably don't have board directors comprised of former senators, <laughs> CEOs, lobbyists. They don't they don't have that same kind of sway. You know, so when looking at you know what banks are at the most risk for a run, it's your local small community bank. That's really unfortunate. Well, and what what's most concerning is, um, you know, what, what I'm looking at. I, I mean, the the local economy is comprised of your small and mid-sized banks. J.P. Morgan, uh, PNC, they're probably not lending money to a brewery in Zionsville. You know, they're not lending money to the local car dealer. They they're borrowing to big corporations, governments. Sovereign wealth funds. I mean, if you're a J.P. Morgan and you have trillions of dollars, it's not advantageous to lend two million dollars to a car dealer. It's not worth your time. So, you know, the local economy, yeah, it's comprised of these small and mid-sized banks who are doing most of the lending. They're the ones at most risk. Um, so, really, that's my biggest, you know, folks looking at whatever bailouts, moral hazard, is my money safe? Uh, the the biggest concern I have when I'm looking at is, I mean, look if these small banks if, if they're more at risk or God forbid they go under, who's lending money to the local home builder? Who's, who's lending money to the small business? I mean that I think is what is under the hood or under the radar um, that's not getting discussed enough. So let's so okay so we had this issue where we. You know, as a country, we could see these banks going down. We had people that had more than two hundred fifty thousand in a bank. We didn't know if there was going to be a domino effect. Mm -hmm. And then we saw the prices of gold, silver, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin. Bit Bitcoin, I could not believe. Surge. The fact. Okay, look, I would just say I've never been a Bitcoin believer, evangelist. I've been. You know, I've been on record saying that. Uh, the fa okay, the fact Bitcoin could survive FTX yeah. and you know really just the crypto downturn of twenty two. Uh, I mean, the the value of Bitcoin going up during this recent crisis, 
this might be the first example of it being a flight to safety in a store. I mean, the fact Bitcoin, so you had Silvergate and uh, Signature, which was, Silvergate was really hard in crypto, but Signature was too. I didn't you, know that. There are rumors. So oh, this this gets really dicey. So Barney, remember Barney Frank I just talked about? Yeah. He did an interview with Vanity Fair. I mean, so you have, that's a big magazine. You have a politician, board member. He didn't interview with Vanity Fair. Now, I, I think this might just be, you know, whatever. Conjecture, he's saying this to stir the pot. He says that the government took it over. Um, they shut it down because of crypto. Like they were wanting to hurt crypto. Some people think that. Again, I don't, I I don't want to cast a wide net. This is true. I, mm-hmm. What I heard is they told them, we're going to cover all the depositors except for the crypto companies. And I don't know if that's true. I don't know. But yeah, Barney Frank, he uh, he did his interview. He swore up and down. And again, this is a very significant person. I mean, he, he literally wrote the legislation that has regulated these banks post-2009. He says that they took it down because of its crypto involvement. That's I, I don't how know. Gonna, and that's how they're going to... That's how they're going to try to crush crypto. But uh, but no, listen. If you had two banks that are fairly, I, I don't know if they're significant to the global economy, but they're significant to crypto. Silvergate and uh, Signature Bank, both heavily involved in crypto, and they both you know shut down in the same week. The price of Bitcoin rallies. I mean, if I had told you, if I had told you in February. I think after FTX. So, I mean, the FTX... Well, I up. noticed it held. Yeah. So, FTX was going on, and I'm watching it, and I watch it every day, and, like, it's holding. This is really positive. But, no, th- think about this, though. Um, FTX blows up November last year, and, it, you know, it's still a big story. It's kind of gone to the wayside, but, you know, it, it's just kind of quieted down. Let's, let's say December or January... Um, you can see the future a few months in advance. We and all wish we could see the future. If you can even, if you can see the future one day in advance, you could. Oh, uh, what that's a, that's our conversation. But <laughs> um, let, let's say in January, um, you know, if we are in the thick of the FTX blow up, and you're looking at the price of Bitcoin. I think it went all the way down to like fourteen thousand. Let's say I told you that hey, FTX just blew up. Bitcoin is. At its all time low, and in two months, you're going to have um, sig- the signature bank and Silvergate Bank are both going to blow up. I told you that in January, you would probably you'd think, Oh, it's done, it's going to zero. I mean, I don't pre- know. freaking I don't uh, know. like Pete, Peter, Peter Schiff, and some of these dudes, they would if, like if you had told them that, oh, I mean, they would have just because Bitcoin is in its own class, and I have already sold a lot of my other crypto off Mm -hmm. and I just have, I just pretty much have Bitcoin and Ethereum now because, um, I, they're just in a class of their own. Mm -hmm. They're not like the other coins. They, they have a proof of concept. They're decentralized. It's, it's not easily hackable. It, I mean, it is a safe place to put your money. There's a lot of like market fluctuation on the price. So you really have to look at it as like a long-term hold. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, when that happened, it was just, and I, you know, I kind of go off so much on instinct. My instinct for like the last two years has been telling me that Bitcoin, there was, that it was special, that it, that it really could solve a lot of our problems. And I saw a really good um, talk about how Bitcoin is a scientific discovery, and once you learn and understand it's a scientific discovery, then you realize and how it solves a, like an age-old money problem. And so I was kind of holding on to that, really interested. And then when this happened, it really solidified um, my feelings towards Bitcoin. Well, again, this is the first time where, uh, in response to a crisis, it's gone up. That did not happen uh, in 21, in 22. Uh, well, I, I guess it did happen in 21 at first, but uh, when the Fed started raising rates, when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, I mean, when you had you know these kind of crises and black swan events, 
it was going down in response. Uh, the fact that, I mean, we have a banking crisis, it's going up. Um, that's, it's an interesting really development that I would not, I personally, I would not have predicted. I, don't, I would have I, said the well, opposite. It's like you got some Bitcoin and you see that maybe you've got $2 million. I don't know. And you're seeing that this bank's fallen. These people can't get their money. Um, what am I going to do with my money? Is my money safe in my bank? Like, because at that moment, we didn't know it was going to happen. Like, remember your tension because you're like, I don't know what the, you know, what the consequences of this is. Is it going to dom domino and start affecting other? Because mm -hmm. everything's so interconnected and with technology and everything. Right. And so I think that because of that, a lot of people were having those same thoughts and same worries and they pushed their money into Bitcoin. Um, I mean, I think some did, but also if you're a small business with, you know, 50 employees, having four or five million dollars in a check account for payroll is really not that much. But you know, a business you can't you can't put your money in Bitcoin to make payroll. It has to it has to be a checking account. So I, I'm sure there were some people who I mean not so there were probably a lot of people who did a flight to safety. But I, I mean the big accounts, you know, the small businesses, I mean I think most of them just had to find a different bank to run their payroll through. Well, I think that everybody, I think there's a lot of people that just saw the utility or an increased utility and you can self custody this Bitcoin. So no one's going to take your deposit and, and, and invest it somewhere. It's yours. It's your little digital. Well, if it was an, F, if, if, if it was FTX, they did. Well, that's why you can't leave it on an exchange. And I saw a really good interview with a guy who had a uh, investment firm and they invested heavily in crypto and he had just pulled all this money onto that exchange because they were going to do some buying and selling of crypto and so he just taken a huge amount of his his clients money put it on the exchange right before it went bust and they lost everything on FTX yeah he put it and it was because FTX if you had so much of their FTT token, they they waived fees. See, it's mm -hmm. all about the fees. They waived the fees, and then so he was passing that savings onto his customers. That were, and he was trading for his customers, trading crypto, and his whole business went up. Oh, yeah. he was making he put his payroll through FTX. Well, it was his like investors money that was just gone. Okay. So was he? He was like investing other folks' money. He was investing money. other Ooh. folks' money. Yeah. Well, good luck trying to get that back. Oh yeah. Trying to claw. I can't imagine trying to claw that back in bankruptcy. Uh, he doesn't even know like what he. At the, at the time of that filming of that episode, he he didn't even like he didn't even know if he was going to ever have an investment company again. Like that. Is how well, because no one's going to give no one's going to give money to invest. Well, like it, it is his fault, but at the same at the same time, like I have a little bit of sympathy. Like maybe it's. It's not completely your fault. I don't know. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, nobody, nobody saw it. Nobody saw. Now we've circled back around. To FTX. We're gonna do a separate episode <laughs> on that because there's got there's too much to talk about. But we we'll, we're gonna stay focused <laughs> on the banking crisis and and FTX. Um, and man, we've we've talked about a lot. We'll yeah, probably think, start wrapping up yeah, I soon. Think so too. Um, I I want to. We're gonna have to do another follow up episode because we really. We've not talked much about Cred Swiss. Um, haven't talked a whole lot about the Federal Reserve and the government response. What those consequences might be. I want to look more at that. Um, part two. Yeah, part two. But definitely, um, I, I, I'm just gonna say it right now. I mean, so far this looks contained. Yeah. Now they may have said that you know before you know previous crisis when everything hit the fan. Right now. It looks like it's under control. There's no contagion. It's not you know wildfire spreading. Um, in, in the past, this has happened with whatever the Lehman moment or in the '80s. Uh, it it did spread. It's more problematic. So that's the good news I want to bring home to everybody. You can relax, <laughs> ease up a little bit. I don't think people can ease up a whole lot. I, I, think, I just don't think it's that you can't. It's not the time. I think part of it is they're going to use this to like really come down on crypto, and they're going to try to squat. Well, they're going to come down the banks. 
I mean, I, I can't imagine what revenue... They're going to come down to the banks and the banks are not going to like fund and, and loan people money or allow people to deposit money that have these crypto companies. What's it going to look like for, what's gonna look for small businesses trying to get loans 10 years from now with smaller banks if they have more onerous regulations, if they have to hold more money in reserve? That's what I'm most concerned about. But again, the good news, it's contained right now. I, mean, I think they've taken the right steps, but what are the consequences of those steps? Um, so again, the FDIC who insures your deposits, it's up to that $250,000 limit. Now, are they going to raise that? Are they gonna guarantee all deposits? If they do, what's that gonna look like? These are very hard to say. You have, I mean, you have really two schools of thought. They could raise all deposits on one side, not well. They can raise the limit, and they can guarantee all deposits. That would lead to more risk taking. Because if you're a bank and you're like, oh, all the deposits are guaranteed, it's just free money. I can lend all this money, however much I want. I know the Fed's going to save me. On the other side, if they regulate more and have higher capital requirements, they have to do more stress tests with the Federal Reserve. Then they're not going to lend more money. Um, it's just Maybe very it's hard. time that we all just get responsible. Yeah, that's the you know, wish we can't. Protecting. You know, it's it's time where we don't have an omni bill, a uh, uh, bill that is you know you don't have the money for. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to lend out ninety seven percent of the money. Like mm -hmm. I mean, you tell us you could tell us to like a ten year old, and it doesn't make any sense. You know. Mm -hmm. And they try to make it well, seem like my, it's so my goal, complicated. My goal is to have this all make sense to a 10 year old. <laughs> well, I don't know if I've done the best job. I'm really trying to try to break things down, but this is like, it's so complex. And I think that's something me. that the system hides behind. Like, oh, this is so complex that, you know, you don't understand why we can, we can loan out 99% of the money. And that goes back to what I'm saying. The big, <laughs> the big is so complex. The big banks, they, they have lawyers. Uh, accountants, they have politicians, the board directors, the small bank, they do not have access to all that. So if, if that's if there's going to be more regulations, it's going to be more complicated, the small banks are just going to say, screw it, we're not lending money. It, it's not advantageous to have to meet all these requirements. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know, but I think that we are sold this story that we can't understand it, like the average person. When really, what's going on is there's smoke and mirrors because there's just a lot of like fraud and corruption and exploitation Truth. in the banking system, just like in everything else. Truthfully, I think it's so complex, and the reason it's presented as being so complex, the people at the top. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to insult them or say they you know don't know what they're talking about. They're very smart people. Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary. Jerome Powell, I mean, these are all very smart people, but truthfully, like, I don't think they know. I mean, they, they have access to information the average person couldn't imagine having. I don't think they know what's going on fully. I don't think they know what to do next. So, I mean, hiding behind all this complexity and lawyers and all these, you know, PhD economists, I don't think they know what's going to happen next. I don't think they know what to what to do. I think if, if you could put smart people in a room to start solving problems without people that have huge interest and huge amounts of money that can lobby mm -hmm. to keep things going their way, where they can like take the majority of wealth from everybody else, if like we got the corruption out of the way, yeah. I think we'd solve these problems really quick. I mean, they, they need to clamp down on lobbying. This, this is good, another topic. To do another <laughs> but, well, they, need, they need to clamp down on lobbying, roll back Citizens United, um, roll back gerrymandering. So I don't even know what this is. Well, that's, again, we can't do better. it. We can't do yeah, it. Yeah, but there's, I mean, yeah, there's so many rollbacks, and uh, again, I mean, yeah, yeah, there's, there's just all this stuff they do to keep power at the top, keep vested interest more, more locked in. Um, but yeah, again, I, I really I think that they're smart people. Uh, they made a bad move with waiting so long to raise interest rates. But yeah, personally, I, they hide, they hide behind all this complexity and you know they speak in this esoteric language of PhDs that the average person can understand. 
And I think they do that because personally, they do not know what is going to happen. They don't know their next move. I, I mean, it's really when you're at home navigating all this, and may, maybe that is, you know, makes you feel hopeless or lost. I, I hope that you would, no. I hope you would take away, I hope it would give you confidence and faith that, look, they, they're some of the smartest people, you know, have uh, MBAs and PhDs from Stanford, Harvard. They have access to all this data. I don't think they know what's going to happen next. They don't know what to do. But, so, and again, that's really... Giving, but we're giving people a little bit of insight. Like, advice. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to we're give not, financial no, advice. No, yeah, we only, we only provide financial education, no advice. Right, mm -hmm. but maybe like kind of diversifying where your money's at, you know? If you have everything in a credit union, maybe you shouldn't have everything in a credit union. I think credit unions are safer than banks, though, because they're they're member owned, and credit union is smaller by design. I don't, I need to research that, but I think credit union they offer lower rates, and you know, they don't do the same kinds of borrowing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I have takeaways: what you can do. Um, yeah, if you have several million dollars, I, mean, I think they don't need my, you know. Probably don't need my insights. They already know this, but <laughs> if you're loaded, you know, you put your money in gold, real estate, stocks. You know, if you have ten million dollars personally, you have it in a checking account. It takes some wild risk. Mm -hmm. Now it's there's harder. Some people out there that are doing that, that are just really successful. They, yeah, or, or, or maybe that uh, got inheritance money that they're just they put ten million in a checking account. If you're a small business, it's a little bit tougher though, because if you have four million to make payroll. You're not going to use 10 checking accounts for a small business. The fees, the maintenance is too much. Yeah, so that's large companies they have the resources to do that. See, so yeah, I, I would say small, you know, small business. That's why I would uh, really I would, I would say if you're setting up any checking account, and this is probably going to happen regardless going forward, people are going to have to start looking at the strength of the bank. You know, what's the reserve requirement, and in a competitive free marketplace, people are going to gravitate towards the strongest bank and hopefully that leads to you know better competition and stronger banks what yeah, it what it might suddenly we need like you know an education and finance that we never needed before well I, I think what might happening also a lot of people are just gonna send all their money to the big banks and there's gonna be you know more concentration of wealth and wealth inequality we'll see mm -hmm. okay well we'll talk about this more next time yeah, I mean, this, this is going to be, we're, we have a FTX update um, coming up in a few months. We're going to delve into this more, do some deeper dives. I mean, there's, there's just a lot uh, to talk about. I, I don't want to, I don't want to saturate everyone too much. But anyway, um, signing off for the Steel Trap Mind Show, I'm Andrew Carter. And I'm Jennifer Bolton. Hey, thank you guys and for this tuning is, in. This is Archie. <laughs> this is Archie Bald. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, once again for tuning in, guys. I um, hope you have a great week out there. Thank you.